Urban, I'm wondering if you could speak to the fact that, you know, obviously you came into this job with some promises that you made to your family. Obviously you kept those. But now that you're back playing for a national championship, does it prove to you that you can also win coaching this way? Well, I don't. I don't mean to be disrespectful at all. I, I don't. I've coached the same way. You know, I, um, I just think that's. I, I don't want to keep going back. I want to keep pushing forward. But uh, I'm. Just, you know, I have a great staff, and I love our players. We push them really, really hard, and that's never changed. And you know, I don't think you can do it any other way. You know, there's some other things I've changed, but the coaching is. It's the way we do our business, and and that I don't think that'll ever change. Just to follow up, uh, Darren Lee's a kid that you talked to us about, I think, in the spring. You mentioned him as a guy who was going to end up playing for you, but you said nobody really knew about him. Can you just talk about his development? Yeah, I, I credit Coach Fickle with that one. Uh, he came to camp like five, six times. I rejected him probably four times. Shows you how good of an evaluator I am. And uh, he's a quarterback for New Albany. And... Uh, the thing that we loved about him, he kept competing. You know, in this generation, you know, sometimes kids say, "I'm not coming to camp." You know, and there was a day where everybody went to camp so you could you can watch him. You, know, you get to watch a little ten play highlight video, and you got to make a you know a two hundred fifty thousand dollar decision on a guy to give him a scholarship to Ohio State. And uh, you know, the most great players that I've been around, they come to camp, they tear it up, you offer them a scholarship, they shake your hand, and they go play. And that's what uh, Darren Lee. That's why I love that kid, competitor, and. Uh, and as a, re, as a result, you know, Coach Fickle made the right decision. He worked with them. They have a great relationship. And that's the best way to go about this business, you know, to go compete and work with a guy that, that might be your coach someday. It's, it's been a, that's a great story. Front row, Bill. Yes. Uh, now that you've looked at Oregon, what jumps out at you on tape? Obviously, the thing people always jump at is, is their tempo. Yeah, I have not. Uh, I've watched a lot of their offense. Um, not to the point where I'm going to make decisions. I give suggestions because we run similar offenses, a lot of the similar plays, um, their tempo, and then the the thing that, you know, the best player, the Heisman Trophy winner, and he should have been the Heisman Trophy winner. I'm glad he got it for a lot of reasons. I'm glad he got it. Uh, I just love who he is, you know, and I've, I've been around him. Um, when he first, when he was a young player, I went out there and visited, and I remember them telling me about him. You know, I think uh, Chip recruited him when he was, uh, is it Puno? Which high school is it? I know St. Louis, yeah, the other great one. And uh, um, was a backup for a while and just a great kid. And I, I think that's so good for college football to see a guy like that and win it. Um, great, great player, great, great person, great leader, you can tell. Plays his best when it's hard. Plays his best. You know, the Michigan State game was a perfect example. He extends plays, and he's the, he's the biggest challenge. You know, tempo offense is really hard, but tempo offense with an average player, it's not that hard. He's the one that uh, keeps the... The chain's moving, and that's that's when tempo gets you. Uh, the risk of tempo offense, which I debated for years, is you know you three and out them, and then 24 seconds you just took off the clock, and you're playing a good team. That's not good. Uh, so there's there's plus and minuses. You have a quarterback like that. That's usually pluses. Um, question about Jacoby Warren, an undersized guy. I know you love the family. Uh, did you ever expect him to be what he's and what has he meant to this team? He is a, a, a tribute to the family. He's a, every born I've ever met is like that. And uh, I've, I've had two of them. And if there's another one, I want him, you know, that's, that's coming along. It's if there's something in the – no, there's not. It's the way they were raised. They're tough. They fight. Did I ever think, you know, when I first shook his hand when I got here in 2012, you know, and he was already committed to us, and he walked through the door, I was like, uh-oh. What's this now? And I actually started thinking maybe he can be a blocking fullback. And uh, he's turned out to be, have a heck of a year. He's tough. He's a very good player, great leader, great uh, team guy. Yeah, I love Jacoby. Front row, Tim. Yeah, Urban, you, you've spoken about this a couple of times, but you, during, I call it your sabbatical now, but you're, you're off. You spent time out there in Oregon. You have no Chip Kelly. What was it about? Conversations with him and stuff about the uh, up tempo and stuff that really, really intrigued you. Is Probably the thing that set it off was a coach named Nick Aliotti, who I've known him for 25 years. He's a defense coordinator, long time, and a, a friend of mine from back when I recruited California 25 years ago. We used to have dinner together, and and, uh, and he's as old school as you get. And you know, you go in there, they're playing Lion King music. They're you know, they have like a DJ at practice and bizarre stuff now. And I remember, I, even I was like, "What is this? You know, this is." 
I work for Earl Bruce. I can't. That's, we haven't. We didn't have Lion King and DJs at practice when Earl was coaching here. And but I was talking to Nick Aliotti, and I, Chip and I are good friends. And I, he says, you know, this is the only way to do it. I looked at him and said, what are you talking about? This is the only way to do it. And for Chip Kelly to to create a culture, and, and Belichick talks about it all the time, where everyone's aligned, everyone. You walk in the facility, it's about win the day. It's about, in, well, I'm not here to promote Oregon, but I just, I'm here to promote. Uh, I, I would like to think that people walk in the Ohio State football facility now, and it took a little while, that from uh, Amy, my assistant, to uh, everybody associated, the facility person, everybody, this is the way we do it. Really not a whole lot of conversation about it. And uh, we, we have a culture here too. And so that's what I took. Instead of saying, let's go take their culture, it's something I always believed. Now, when you see teams fail, it's not because of bad players. It's not because of bad coaches. It's because of alignment issues. I'm convinced of that more now than ever after being in this business for so long. And they're a tempo offense. What just, I mean, obviously you took some of that too. I mean, uh, you wanted to go yeah. that direction. Yeah, we, uh, at Florida, there's a, there's a uh, con uh, misunderstanding that we were a big tempo team. We weren't. And I fought that. We actually sent Dan Mullen, who was my coordinator, sent him to Missouri when Missouri was a, had a breakout season. And they came back, and it was – and I snatched that after about four days of spring practice. And it was just technique went to hell. And, and our receiver coach is over there signaling instead of coaching receivers. And, you know, that was – we ended that real fast. And the negative of, of what's happened with the tempo offense is, is you have an incredible leader at quarterback. He simply just takes a snap now. He's not able to – it's not as easy. In the old days, you know, the – the stories of Joe Montana looking at Jerry Rice and winking at him. And, you know, there is, there's still that intangible value of this great game of football that I'm, lets me and you do this. And it's harder when that guy you're winking at's 25 yards away. So that, that's, and I had pounces and I had T bone. I didn't want to lose that huddle. Uh, obviously, we've lost it. And, and there's still opportunity for great leadership, I've learned. But that was the thing that held us back from going full up tempo, you know, four or five, six years ago. You saw that as the future, though, didn't you? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it is. So everybody says it's not. It is. It's, uh, it's an advantage for the offense. And if you don't take it, then that's fine. But uh, even I know Alabama is moving in that direction. And, you know, is it full speed all the time? No, we're not. But there's certainly – that gives us an advantage at times. All right, Austin. Perfect. I know your uh, overall offensive <coughs> philosophy doesn't change regardless of your quarterback. It seemed like there were, there were tweaks along the way from Braxton to – JT seemed more horizontal with the passing game. It's Cardell, it seems like it's more vertical. Is that is that fair? That's more the defense we're playing. I think that's very observant, and that's true if you did a little chart like we do. There's more downfield throws. You know, the last two teams we faced uh, challenged us to go do that. There's some teams we played this year that when they're off, you have to take the underneath stuff. And, uh, you know, Wisconsin was going to be, we knew what they were getting into, and it was going to be shot day. And we, if we don't hit those, it might be a different outcome. And then the uh, same thing with Alabama, really aggressive defense, challenge you, uh, bump and run coverage. You know, hitches against bump and run aren't any good. Soft quarters is when you see us take the short stuff. So that's more, I wouldn't say it's more the uh, personnel, it's more the, what the defense gives you. With, uh, with Evan Spencer, you've talked about how valuable he's been, not just catching the football all season long, but that last game. Unbelievable. Does that sum it up, throwing a block, throwing a touchdown? He's the MVP. He's, he's the the MVP of our team. He's the leader of our team. He's a guy that uh, at the right time, I'll probably uh, make an executive decision and make him a captain. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's a wonderful kid that uh, he's really what, to me, football is all about. You know, he's a reason, him and sitting in the special teams meetings, him, every, you know, just throwing himself in people's way and blocking and, you know, I mean, the, the play that sprung, the one you're talking about, the one that sprung a Zeke for an 85 yard, Touchdown was he took two guys out, and that's no one's. There's not one person in this facility shocked that he did that. Second row, David. Are we going off Austin's question a little bit? Nick Saban kind of made an interesting comment after the game that the Cardell's kind of uh, <coughs> opened up and maybe showcased your outside speed in a way he did not see on the first 11 games. You mentioned it was maybe what the defense is giving you, but all your quarterbacks have different skill sets. What maybe does Cardell give you that makes it a different look? He's a better pocket guy because he's big. You know, we uh, with Braxton early, certainly early, early in his career, he was uh, a guy that we tried to move around a little bit. You know, first one reason was our offensive line was just starting to be good. 
you know, and you have to help them out by moving the pocket. Um, and he's dynamic outside the pocket. Uh, JT is a six foot, you know, he'll tell you he's six two, or he's six one. He's, he's not. He's, he, I don't want to get into what he is, because he's, but he's a great player that, uh, you know, there's times where he, you know, he's a very good deep ball thrower, too. The one thing, all three of those guys are very, uh, very good deep ball throwers. Uh, but Cardell is the first guy I've had, I want to say, since Alex that is up there that can hide a low a pass over the top of a defensive line. And that's, you know, that's rare. That's hard, that's hard to find those guys. Front row, Dave Biddle. Your punt re return game struggled against Alabama. Granted, you're facing an excellent punter. But what can be done to tweak that at this very late stage of the season? Just your thoughts about that. Yeah, the kick return struggle, too. You know, our return game at times this year was good. We were, I don't know if we are, Kerry's going to do that with our special units tomorrow, but we led the nation in field position, uh, number one on offense, number one on defense. And I don't know if that's, they say that's never been done before. And that's when you see those signs, are, I guess they're covered up, but there's signs that uh, talk about field position in here nonstop. And it's called the plan to win. And it's, uh, it's something we spend a lot of time on. And it's just a... Uh, uh, a great example of when, when, it, when it, it's no longer theory, it's, I call it uh, to our players, it's no longer theory, it's testimony. That how do you go win a game? In theory, this is how you win it, then we can prove it now when we, we do all kinds of statistical conversation with our players. Uh, so to answer your question, it was the first time since I want to say the first or second game we had, didn't return the ball outside the 20 on a punt, on a kickoff, and we did it twice, and punt return really struggled. So what can we do? We just work hard at it. Uh, it's not just the returner, it's the hold up guys. And uh, we realized we faced a bunch of talented guys, too. Um, their, their, their coverage units, Alabama's, were excellent. And parents being able to travel to bowl games, parents of players, I know you've been outspoken about this. What do you think can be done? I know they get $800. Do you think they everything should be paid for? Do you think there's middle ground? Oh, no, you think no, you can't do that. Uh, I think each family should get a, a stipend. And I, you know, I'd be disappointed that doesn't happen. That's, I'm waiting for someone, one of you guys to just blow it up. And no one seems to want to do that. I don't know. You know I just more than the stipend of, than what they get right now. They get eight hundred. Is that right per? Yeah, go you yeah. Try, My family couldn't go there for eight hundred dollars. Right, yeah, and, you know, you know, yeah. So I just and I'm the Big Ten Commissioner's office. You know, I imagine they're give them eight hundred each. You know, and give uh, our coaches eight hundred. You know, it's all across the board. You know, our administration. You guys get eight hundred bucks. You down there. I just don't think that's right. And it's a it's a fifteen game season now. It is what it is. You have 85 scholarships. That's a lot of wear and tear on these players. I'm noticing it. I can see it. And I'm, I'm, I've never practiced like this. They were being very cautious right now because your bodies weren't meant. This is back when they did the 85 scholarship rule. There's 12 games. And the three that they added aren't against one double A or, you know, whatever they say, the smaller schools. The three that you're playing are Wisconsin, Alabama, Oregon. Just throw those on the end of the schedule, and that's why when I hear people make you know these committees, we need some coaches on these committees to have some really good conversation about players' families and wear and tear, and maybe less about TV contracts. So that'd be uh, real interesting. You guys, you guys are allowed to write that, create some, stir it up a little bit. I'm trying to coach our game, man. I, I can't. That's your job. That's you know, other people's. I know Gene, Gene Smith. The great thing about Gene Smith. He's, he's practiced. He's a football player. So when I have good conversation with Gene Smith, it's not now, you know, what about the billboards? What about the, you know, are we going to sell the shirts? Or are we not going to sell the shirts? What about your jacket you wear on the sideline? And all those things. And I get that. That's all important. But when Gene Smith, and that's why I have so much respect for him, when you talk about the player, he looks at me and he goes, I understand. I understand. I got it. I got it. Here's what we need, Gene. Here's why. I'm good. And he's played football before. And that's why I, I, I didn't. I heard someone said he came out and said that he's gonna. I don't. That doesn't surprise me one bit, because Gene Smith understands a student athlete. Front row left, Doug. Urban, beyond tempo stuff with you and Oregon offensively, just the way you attack teams, with play calls, and that kind of stuff. How similar are we talking about philosophically? Well, Tom is uh, Tom is a, a disciple. He studied it for many years. He studied uh, actually Chip Kelly uh, first started studying when I was at Utah. You know, he went from New Hampshire and he started that evolution, and that'd be a good conversation for Chip. Uh, but there's a lot of similarities uh, between the two programs. 
as far as how do you go attack a defense. And then what is that, how does that play into that, this game at all? Your, is your defense used to playing against your offense so they can defend Oregon? That's a great question. I, I think what well, remains to be seen. I know I've gone in there and tell our defense what we don't like, you know, what bothers us, and I'm sure they're doing the same thing. Uh, they see it every day in practice. So, and we're not, we're, there, there are some things they do much better than we do on the perimeter, and there's things we do a little better than them. So it's not exactly the same, but there's a similar philosophy. So I'm sure there's a lot of conversation between the two staffs, more, more than normal games. And before, <coughs> before last season, we talked so much about the 1,000-yard rusher and Carlo, what Carlos did last year in this offense, what Zeke has done this year in this offense. And you told us this since you got here, but that power run aspect of, of what your offense does, with what we've seen Zeke and the line do the last two games, just how, how vital is that to what you guys, how you guys attack? Yeah, the, the, there was a, you know, uh, a hit on our, you know, saying so you never had a 1,000-yard rusher. And in one year I had two 900-yard rushers. You know, there's, we're always, guys get hurt or, you know, it's not by purpose. Sometimes we have three good running backs and they all have a lot of numbers. So it's worked out the last two years. I don't hear that much anymore. And I think we're going to get a 2,000-yard rusher someday. I you know, would love to have that. But that's usually your, we don't like to, you know, we have other good players that touch the ball. Uh, the thing I look at the end of the year is more rushing yardage. And, and we try to be a top 10 in the country rushing. And most of the time, we are. Most of the time, we're a very good rushing team. Uh, it just depends on you know your personnel and who's actually carrying the ball. And it's all about the development of the offense line. So you know, some, the, the concept of our offense is a, a power offense in a spread set. That's ours. It's not the chuck and duck and basketball and grass and all that. It's a power offense. And that's why when I first, you know, I'm going to recruits home and I say, well, you guys, you know, rushing the ball. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then we have to be armed with all the stats, which we are. Rusty? Ruben, you talk about wear and tear on the players. I'm wondering, when you came here, there were some who questioned your health situation. I'm just wondering if you're living up to uh, what's up on the wall. Doing great, yeah. Everybody's okay at it. With your family, they all think that you're doing everything you're supposed oh, to do. Oh, great. Yeah, they like winning. <laughs> a, bunch of, a bunch of smiles. Uh, yeah, everything. Thanks for asking. And uh, I, it, everything's great. It couldn't be better. I'm very blessed. And uh, it's a, I mean, it's a challenge because you you get consumed. And uh, and there's a little consumption right now. You know, you're you're down to the eleventh hour after this one. You know, after the twelfth, and you get a little time to take a deep breath. And everybody gets that. Uh, but that doesn't mean we all watch out for like a good family. How's it going? And how's your weight? How's this? And you need to lose weight now instead of you need to gain weight. Uh, and did you have any doubts at all losing a 1,500 yard rusher, whatever Carlos was? Yeah. Have, have that fall on Ezekiel's shoulders? Did you well, here's an interesting stat. We have seven players off of last year starting in the national. I don't know if it's ever been done before. Seven players left our program a year ago and are starting, not playing. Not backups, not practice squads, starting in a National Football League. In the history of college football, I'd like to know if that's ever been done. I don't think it has starting. That tells you how good that team was last year. And uh, you take three offense linemen, you take a tail, the starting tailback, best receiver, uh, best linebacker, and best corner. I think there might be another one in there. There's seven guys starting. That's why I knew that, you know, when, especially the two juniors left, Shazir and uh, Roby, and, I, you know, as a coach, you're like, how do you replace that? So I thought a year, and I, start, I, I thought these young kids were pretty good coming up, and that's why I made a comment. In my own heart, I said, this is, a, what is 15? The 15 team is watch out. And then they got better and better and better and better. That's the great thing about college. You're a pro, you don't probably see that much improvement because they're veterans already. Did Elliot in particular step in for Carlos? We had big plans for I, I, we We had a lot of confidence in him. It started kind of slow. Um, uh, his last two games are, are really productive. Uh, he's a little tougher than I thought he would be. His uh, post-contact yards are probably a little bit more than I thought they would be. He's a he's a really tough runner, and uh, so a little bit surprised. But we it's not like we didn't have high expectations for him. Far left, Matt. Um, I remember you saying when they came up with the playoff that you can't imagine having to play a game and then preparing for another one. And I'm just wondering, you're living it right now. How how is it? How difficult is it? Or uh, just just, I, I ask our players. I don't. I'm not one of those guys. Who's been known to say, you know, I, I check with our players constantly. Now the guys I trust, how you hanging in there? I mean, this is the that last game, that was a hammer. Now, 
I mean, even our players looked at me after the game like, wow. You know, because Alabama, especially in the trenches, you know, you face a team like Alabama, I mean, gigantic human beings. And so, you know, we're just, I'm, I'm, I'm watching it like I've never have before. I mean, from the point, amount of contact we're having to off their feet, to, and that's where my strength coach, and we have a performance team here, and it's, we use a GPS system. We do hydration, so we test our hydration every day. And, and that's where I think this game has changed, and, and it's in a trajectory where, uh, it's really good for the player because you don't you try to keep them out of harm's way as far as your body. You know, the, the soft tissue, you know, I can go on a dissertation about this stuff because we've studied it so hard, but the soft tissue injuries, injuries should not, if you do a good job, your strength staff, performance team, that's, that player shouldn't go out there if they're dehydrated. And, and there's a much better ways to find out now than there was years ago. So, and, and I'm telling you, for 15 games, I don't know if you could do it any other way. You, you, you old school it with 15 games, you're going to you go jog out there with 35 players. So you have to be very cautious. Do you have, I mean, this sounds silly to say because you're playing for the national championship, but do you have any concerns to get back to that level that you were at oh, yeah. in the I Sugar mean, Bowl, you know, next Monday night? That's our concern. And then getting ready for a tempo offense, which means you got to be practicing hard. That's what you just said is the concern for this game. Far left, Pat. Yeah, Urban, you touched on it a little bit, but your 2013 signing class <clears throat> what surprised you most, I guess, about their maturity and being ready to play and be impact players as quickly? Yeah, really disappointed uh, we didn't play them. They're, they're, a lot of those guys redshirted. And uh, there, there was some – I was very disappointed. And, and they weren't ready. We don't redshirt. It's not like we're going to say, hey, let's save them for this uh, – what is it, 15? Hey, let's save them for the 17 year. Let's have a heck of a year. You can't do that now because they're all gone anyways after three. If you're a great player, you're gone. So play them. If they're not good enough, don't play them. And that's the mentality we have when we go out and recruit. When they're here, we don't talk about, well, we're going to save you and let you mature a little bit. You know, that, was, that, that used to be a big deal in college football. At this level, and I'm Pete Carroll, I stole from him when I, one day I was listening to him talk at USC back in like 06. And he says, we don't redshirt guys here. I thought, how cool is that? Go out and recruit guys that can go play. Because kids want to play. So I, I was disappointed, Pat, that uh, they didn't play more their first year because there's a handful of those guys are redshirted. And some of those guys won't be here for their fifth year. So we screwed up. We didn't get another year out of them. But, that, but now the level they're performing at. Oh, yes. Yeah, Am I surprised? I'm sorry. What? Just the, the number of guys from that class that are performing really well now for you, uh, does that surprise you this year? I, yeah, I, I think that Darren Lee, Eli Apple, uh, Joey Bosa does not surprise me, Ezekiel Elliott. You know, someone, uh, you gave me those names one day, we were walking off the field, and I was like, wow. Yeah, some of them did surprise me. We're going to take a pause for just a moment. Coach, I want you to hear some pretty good news. The football playoff is going to provide us. Okay. okay. <laughs> the college football playoff, per NCAA rules, is going to provide $1,250 per parent for the families this year. That's great. This year? This year. It's just you just, uh, you sure I can say that? Yeah, it's flame awesome. Uh, per parent, uh, to per parent, yeah, per parent, so two parents. So that's $2,500. There you go, nice for job. This year's game. Just, just coming out. Can you react to that? Yes. Clay, you're next. Here. Go ahead. That's, that's, that's great. That's the best news I heard. Yeah, go ahead. That's great news. So. You, you, you started the fight, and I know Andy Apple and some of the parents on this team have been quite vocal about it. Uh, and Gene Smith, don't, don't forget our, our athletic director. Gene Smith's a powerful man in the sport. and. And uh, all due respect to all other ADs, that's, that's for him to step out on the line like that. That's good. That's good. I, I'd like to see our commissioners jump out on the on deck too and, and say this should happen because they're all employees of the student athlete. Student athletes don't work for us. We would take them away and how, how's our job? You know, how to take away the student athletes and uh, who, who are you coaching, who are you AD and who are you uh, commissioner and for? And that's where I'm really fired up over that, Jerry. That's, that just kind of made my day. That's good. So families get to watch their son play in the first ever uh, national championship with providing a uh, hardship that they'll have to take loans. and Or worse than that, you're going to take it from someone that you're not supposed to take money from. And then we'll miss a bowl game. You know, that's, that's, that's outstanding news. <laughs> Games you won. Do you go back in your notes at all? You know, when, 
packages practices are a little different. You know, this those ones we had 37 days to prepare. I remember in 06, I think it was 37 or 47, it's some ridiculous number. Uh, and that was the first, 06 was the first one that was removed from the tr traditional bowl date. So um, it's just a much different. This is a one game shot that really have four practices in shoulder pads. And uh, tomorrow we're gonna give our guys a day off of practice, not a day off of preparation, but you can't, you just can't go any. The tempo we went the last three days, you just can't. Are you going to break them down? Hireman uh, uh, is, uh, what's the word, uh, probable. And Dontre Wilson is probable now. Second row left, Marla. You mentioned on the TV and the basketball game about the Penn State game, sort of you felt like that was kind of the kind of turning point. I just wondered if, was that mentally? Mental and toughness. And, and you don't win that game unless someone – a group of players like Billy Price, one of the uh, that Pat was talking about, 2013. He's part of that 2013 group that grew up. He was he was not very good. He was uh, struggled last year, struggled early in the game in the season this year. And every player has it. When you become a player, it's like you're that's it's time. And that was his time. And he did a great job against a very good defense line. And, and I just I'll never forget looking out there and seeing that student body, 110,000 people. That it was scripted. I'd say 99% of the time you lose that game. It was scripted that way. They came back, we fell behind, and they scored in overtime. And we got to go down there and score with a freshman quarterback and a uh, freshman lineman and freshman this, freshman that. And they, they toughened up and got it in there. Back row left, Ari. Ruben, every year you're going to take 10 to 12 in state guys in the class. And it was kind of the same way in Florida, just because of how much talent is in the state. Can you imagine how hard it might be for Oregon to put together full classes when 95% of their classes are from out of state, far away places? Because you get to jump off after you get the foundation and make, make to spend more time on Can you comment maybe back on your time at Utah? Yeah, Utah had the same issue. You know, I talked to, you know, uh, other coaches in other states that have that, and that's, that's, that's hard. Matter of fact, when I was offered the job at Utah, that was the only, only thing that was, because there's great football players in Utah, just not enough of them. Um, so that's certainly uh, just it's a little bit more of a challenge, but it's obviously they've overcome it because there's a bunch of great players there. You've been a proponent of alternate uniforms and, and, and things like that because of the impact it has on recruiting. How much do you think? Like, not not you're really. <laughs> a proponent? I just say okay. okay. Yeah. A big difference. Just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how much do you think that having Nike uniforms and gear and things like that can have an impact on an individual? Uh, Nike, Nike's cheating, man. That's that's. I'm saying that because he, the owner is a very good friend of mine. Uh, I, every school has their niche, and you know, God bless Oregon for finding their niche, and that is a huge part of it, man. Their new uniforms, the, the stuff, you know, and and do we listen? And we're big Nike people here as well. And when they bring something to the table, it's hard to say no, and. Uh, I always ask our players. I ask Archie Griffin. I ask Gene Smith because this is this is different now. Ohio State, you start going too far, and there's a lot of old timers out there, me included, that get a little nervous that you start straying away from Scarlet, the old traditional stuff. So you have to be careful. And I think we I think we're classy yet we still maintain our traditional uniforms. I hear we have new ones. I haven't seen them yet. Whenever you're talking to, I mean, whenever you're on the trail, do you guys ever address that with players? Recruits? Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. How much do they like that stuff? They love it. I, just, I bring pictures and all that. Act like I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've become a proponent of it. Tom Herman and I were talking about the other day, and we kind of had a quick run down history lane here, memory lane, and uh, I'm not sure I have, you know. And there's not many people in there that really know how far he's come. Man, there's a couple people that really, I think they've gotten the credit because I've talked about it a little bit, and that's Teddy Ginn and Michelle, his, his mentor and guidance. You know, cause sometimes you hear the word mentor, and I get a cold chill shooting down my spine because mentors 
I don't call it. Like they're the th third uncles. Third uncles aren't good. They're bad. Because third uncles are worried about third uncles. Um, the people that, all they, they could have ruined Cardell. He could have been a statistic. There could have been a big asterisk next to his name. Whatever happened to so-and-so. Because he was given the wrong information and given the wrong guidance. Instead, they looked and said, what do we need to do, coach? And I said, this is it, or it's over. And they said, it's done. Far left. It was Tom, great, Archie. great story. Tom, no, you're good. Uh, Rob Holler, second row middle. Urban, you've uh, been the underdog five times since you've been here. You've won them all. So it's something right. How hard do you push that button? And you're at the underdog again. How hard will you play there? Uh, we don't do that until it gets close to game time, and that's our strength coach and I just kind of feel where we're at. Uh, we usually swing a little bit with it. A little more, a little more detail there. Oh, and I, I don't mean to be like sly about it. I mean it's just we do. It's it depends on the team. It depends where we're at. You know, I don't like pull out my underdog script that we have on in my file in there. It's what kind of team you got, uh, who we playing. You know, we played the we in the. Since I've been a head coach, we've gone berserk with it a few times. You know, and there's other times. That this last one, we didn't really play it up much. You know, I think I told, made the comment that the, I, I really believe that the shot in the arm was Wisconsin beating Auburn. That was when I saw everybody walked a little different to the bus, and and when I saw that, you know, you kind of read your team as you're talking about it. And I can see everybody that was legitimate legitimacy of what they've done. So this one, I, I don't know what we're doing yet. Played two Heisman guys that went to New York. He held them in check. Amari Cooper, Melvin Gordon. You've got another one. Different philosophies. Do you go in? Let's stop those guys. Sometimes you know, let them. You played them right in a row. Yeah, in a row. Wow. Do you, do you say let's stop those guys, or they're going to get theirs? Let's. You know, I, of course you say that's the. The target, you know, and as you try to simulate that at practice, you can't simulate him. I was thinking about moving a receiver sometime, but then he can't throw, and and because he is such a good athlete. Uh, but that's the focal point, you know. When Cooper was on the field or off the field, we knew last week, you know, Melvin Gordon. We had stuff all over the kids' lockers about stop this guy, and and they're, you know, everybody's. It's very clear. And if it's not now, it certainly is getting clearer. That he's the guy. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that seven starters in the NFL. That team didn't have quite the success of this team, and I'm wondering what that says about this club's alignment and where that might come from. Uh, I think that's a great point. I think that's one that uh, I certainly didn't devalue. It was one I, you know, you just don't know because you can't measure that. You can measure a 40-yard dash and how many times they can do 225 and those type of things and how hard they throw a ball. But you don't. That's why I point to the Penn State game. We played awful against Penn State in a tough environment. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about athletics in this game is that the, the immeasurables are the thing that win games. And that's when recruiting, that's why you like, you know, I go back to, I can go off and off about this, but get them to camp and find out what they're made of. You know, here's a guy that runs for 4,000 yards, but they're playing bad teams and he's bigger and faster. Everybody, and you find out when he, you get him that he's, he's, he's not that. And that's the... That's the intangible value of this great game of football that's been around way before us, and we're going to be here way after us. And that's what this team developed and has. No question it has. What right, was that Tom. seven starters thing, though, to your team out there when you're talking to them before practice? What was the gist of that? Just to... I can't remember. The NFL uh, I think it's just the way we, you know, about, I think uh, we always talk about theory and testimony. And when Ed Warner teaches an offensive lineman, this is the way it's supposed to be. It's not theory anymore. And when we first got here, it was, because it's a little bit different. But now that every player that he's coached is in the National Football League, it's, it's testimony. And same thing with the, you know, we talk about our quarterback play, that you know, every quarterback we've ever had our hands on has either been invited to New York or there's been conversation about it. That's not theory anymore. It's testimony about just, just, just because you're getting it. Players get it from all angles now. You know, uncles and peoples, and this is why are you doing this. What? Just we're good. Just follow the plan, and that, that's all that was about. All right, Tom. Robert, can you talk a little about the progression of your offensive line? Basically, four new guys starting, a guy playing a new position, and the job that Warner done. Yeah, he's a, he's a hell of a coach. I'm glad he's with us, and uh, certainly we'll get a head coach opportunity someday. Like all, you know, the plan is uh, well, I'll release the plan, but he's going to be instrumental and. In, 
uh, the offense uh, again. And the good thing is, and this might be a good time to talk about, it, is is I'm losing a great coach with Tom Herman, but we didn't. This isn't you know Rice or Iowa State's offense. We said, hey, let's let's try that. This is the Ohio State offense. And next year, guess what's going to be the Ohio State offense? The year after, it's going to be because Ed Warner will get an opportunity probably down the road. And everybody's going to be, well, what, you know, what do you guys do? Well, we lost a great coach, but we're still running the Ohio State offense. And I think that's when you look at transition of coaches. And Ed Warner, to just reiterate what you said, has done a great job with development of the offense line. But he's a, he's a big picture line coach, which is what makes him so valuable. Far left, Tom Reed. Talk about the progression of, of Joshua Perry since last year and what growth you've seen in him. Yeah, he's a, that's a great question because he's one of my favorite guys. He'll be a captain for us next year. Uh, he's a guy that just does everything right, everything right. He's already had multiple job offers outside of football from our real life Wednesdays. Uh, he's a guy that I'd hire in a minute if he wants to coach. He's a guy that uh, just represents uh, the Perry family and in, in Ohio State the right way. And, and Normally, there's a high correlation between that and playing very well on the field, and he's doing it. And right next to Tom Bruce. Um, it's not been that long since these two teams played in the Rose Bowl. Neither coach is here that was here then. And both programs have been in front of the NCAA since then, taking some hits, some sanctions, but are back at this level pretty quickly. What does that say to you about the programs? Oh, I can't speak for Oregon. I can speak for Ohio State, is, you know, because I was here during that transition. At a school like Ohio State, you're not. You, you should be able to rally back pretty quick. You know, I, I do, and that's why, you know, anytime there's transition or issues you have to deal with, sometimes you get a little bit of a void in a recruiting class, and it's amazing nowadays, one one year, and it's, but, you know, we have a, a really model around here. There's, I don't, there's no excuses uh, from the coaches or players, or I don't want to hear about this, we don't have this, we don't have this, and, you know, the previous staff, no, 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 we're good. Uh, they're your players now, and they're our players now, and, and uh, do the best you can with them, so that's, that's what I, I, I really admire our coaching staff and our players for, uh, to answer your question, be able to rebound. Because it was tough now. You lost seven games. Uh, they came walking in and said within, I think it was there like three or four days, by the way, you can't go to a bowl game. And I remember I sat down for a second like, oh, no. And not so much for that year. But you lose that recruiting class or a group of seniors who are allowed to get up and walk out that door. You get your brains kicked in that year. You're not going to, it, it sends you back a while. And what happened was those group of seniors, if you remember, not one left. Not one left. And that was a very bad football team that became very, very good because of their leadership and they stuck around. And that's, uh, you just bring back some great memories because that was, that's when this all started. When that group of players said, we're not going to leave here. We love Ohio State too much. And they could all picked up and left. We certainly wouldn't be where we are today if they didn't do that. A few more questions. Uh, gentleman in the third row with the glasses. Uh, how much do you live vicariously through the people you lead and how much personal satisfaction do you allow yourself at this point in the season? vicariously through people. In other words, do you take joy out of what other people are feeling at this point in the year because of your accomplishments? Oh, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> that's a hell of a question, man. You got me there. Um, I don't know. Are well, you going to stump me there? Apologize for nothing. All right. One nothing, you're up. I'll get you, I'll get you back, though. There is a second part. I don't want it to be disrespectful. No. Say, okay. Coach, I hope this isn't redundant, but you, know, you touched on this a bit. But this isn't a normal week. I'm sure you want to try to instill that in your kids a bit, but it's uncharted. What, what challenges and or fears does that extra week present? Well, the biggest one is the health of the player, you know, the wear and tear. Uh, that we have to be leery of. You know, I was kind of worried about, you know, is there outside influences? I'm really glad we're here. We're not going down a week early and spending a week in Dallas and I have to deal with all that nonsense. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to get all our hard practices done. That was a real, I think that's the way they did it was perfect. We don't leave until after our Wednesday practice, which is big. Uh, and you get down there and then you, they kind of tie you down and it's not all kinds of, you know, we have already done the bowl experience. So those are my biggest concerns when I, because I didn't, I didn't do any research on this. When I, we won the game, I remember, okay, now I look at my strength coach, what's next? And we sat down and started going through, and I was like, I was excited that they weren't, because that would be a mess if you had to play another game and then had that same, the, the bowl experience. That, that'd be tough. Does that answer your question? Sorry, coach. Last three questions. Brian? Perfect follow up on the uh, offensive line question from earlier. 
run the ball like you did against Alabama? Does that tell you that the offensive line is playing at about as high level as you The last two weeks. Yeah, the, uh, anytime you have back-to-back 200-yard -back, uh, rushers, 200-yard um, rushing performances by a back, and they protect. You know, the, the, the defensive lines the last two weeks were different. You know, Wisconsin was much different. And uh, they're more movement-oriented. And then the, uh, the tree trunks, the big guys against. I mean, big, big guys have stayed fresh. So uh, yeah, no question, this is, the, this is as well as they're playing. Last couple questions. Toledo TV? Uh, you have two years of Daniel Mar Mariota, but they only have two games on your quarterback. Uh, you had a trick play last last game. How much of a game of poker do you try to do uh, to keep it to your advantage? Oh, I, I don't know if there's because uh, once again there's been a lot made about the difference between Cardell and maybe JT uh, for a guy that's very involved in the play calling. There's not that much of a difference. You know, it's very similar. You know, we're not calling more deep balls because Cardell's our quarterback. We're calling more deep balls because we're getting more bumping runs. So I, I, I don't think there's much of a chess match. We know kind of what they're going to try to do, and uh, uh, that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of adjustments that go on during the course of the game. But that's it's regardless if it's Cardell or JT or Braxton. And final question, David. Urbana, Ohio, about an hour from West Virginia, dropping the A from its name on Monday. It's going to be called Urban, Ohio. Any reaction? Urbana, to Ohio is what? It's going to be called Urban, Ohio on Monday. Reaction. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> Urbana, Ohio is dropping the A. It's about an hour. Wow. That's uh, very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Coach.